Uh, thank you, Alan. I hadn't realised you've been stalking me all these years, but <laughs> the truth comes out. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to come along uh, to give the presentation tonight. It's both a pleasure and an honour to be here at such an auspicious organisation such as the SCI. Uh, my topic is doping and anti-doping in sport, although I noticed from the uh, flyer that um, it says doping in sport, what does the future look like? Well, if only we know. Um, I will refer to the future at the end, but of course my crystal ball is, is not that clear, unfortunately. Um, so doping and anti-doping sport, it's a topic, as Alan said, which is uh, constantly in the news, headlines uh, coming out every week with regard to this topic. But of course the uh, headlines that we see are really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it does tend to cause a lot of ripples in society and uh, people wondering about what's happening in the world of sport. Um, but what I hope to do tonight is to look below the surface to see what the reality is with regard to doping and particularly about anti-doping in sport, which is um, a challenge to, to try to tackle this problem. So that's what uh, we hope to do tonight. Uh, overview of uh, what I, I tried to cover. Um, first of all, I'll give you a little bit of historical context, uh, talking about the evolution of doping over the years. Um, speculate a little bit on why drugs are misused by athletes spent quite a lot of time talking about international regulations about doping and anti-doping in sport. Again, speculate on the extent of how much doping goes on and, as I said uh, earlier, we'll speculate a little bit about the future. Now, hopefully you've all had um, your teas and coffees, so therefore you're all performance enhanced by caffeine. <laughs> you might be interested to know that, in fact, caffeine was a prohibited drug um, on the prohibited list up to 2000 when it was withdrawn when it was realised that its performance enhancing effects are, are not that great. And of course it was a, a drug which is very difficult to try to ban in sport because we're all taking it all the time. So there was actually a cut-off level. So I'm sure you're all below that cut-off level tonight. Okay, so that's what we're going to try and get through tonight. So let's start. The word doping, which we keep talking about, is probably derived from uh, the Dutch word dop and again relates to performance. In this case it was um, alcoholic beverage that Zulu warriors used in order to en enhance their prowess in battle. Well I guess same things happening today on the sporting arena. But a, a more modern definition of doping is on this slide. So it's the illicit use of prohibited substance or method to improve an athlete's performance. So I've highlighted the two words there, illicit and prohibited because athletes are constantly looking at ways to enhance performance. But what we're concentrating on here is illegal ways of doing it and the fact that there is a prohibited list that athletes must try to avoid. Now it's nothing new. Athletes have been trying to enhance performance uh, for over 2000 years. Look at the ancient Olympics. Uh, athletes were using perhaps not as sophisticated products as we have these days, but um, herbal preparations in order to enhance their performance. So there's this culture of trying to get one over on your fellow competitor, trying to find that little edge that makes you a little better than they are. So it's a, a long-standing culture within sport. One or two uh, recent landmark doping cases, which uh, some of you may um, remember some of these. It's nice to see actually we have a very mixed audience in terms of age. So uh, has, has anybody competed sport? Should have asked. Excellent. Anybody else? No? Right. Well, some of you may remember some of these uh, events in the past. 1967 was probably my first uh, recollection of a um, doping event uh, involving sport, which was Tommy Simpson, a British cyclist who in the Tour de France was uh, cycling up Mont Ventoux uh, on the, one of the stages of the Tour de France and, and collapsed on his bike. Um, it was extreme conditions, it was extremely hot on that day, dehydration was a factor, but it was subsequently discovered that he was taking amphetamines. And his death uh, pointed out the fact that uh, using drugs in sport, in fact, can have fatal consequences. The next uh, landmark events were in the 1970s and 80s, a um, real tragedy in terms of the athletes who were involved in this, where the old German Democratic Republic, there was state-controlled doping going on. And many athletes were given drugs, <gasps> not even aware that they were given drugs, very potent drugs like anabolic steroids. So it's um, an era of doping sport that um, best uh, not to remember. 
Moving on to 1988, the Seoul Olympic Games, Ben Johnson, the Canadian sprinter, uh, won his gold medal and within hours it was found that uh, the test showed he'd been taking stanazolol, which of course is an anabolic steroid. Now the point about this case was it revealed the extent of doping in sport. Prior to 1988 and Ben Johnson, uh, we knew anabolic steroids were being used by athletes, but mainly in the weightlifting events. So here was a, an athlete who was a sprinter, but when you think about it, sprinting is very much a power event. So athletes were using these potent drugs in all sorts <coughs> of sports. It's not just the, um, uh, the weightlifting and powerlifting events. And it also raised the public awareness about the issue of doping in sport. It really was a, a landmark case. Alan mentioned uh, my book, which was actually published in 1988, so it's good advertising for the book with the Ben Johnson affair. Moving on to 1999 then, um, the Festina affair. I'm afraid I'm going to be talking quite a lot about cyclists in this talk. Um, cycling, as you know, is a sport where use of drugs is prevalent or has been. Let's hope it's, it's cleaning up now. But um, the Festina affair was uh, where the, the team, the Festina team joined the Tour de France was uh, stopped. Their car was stopped at the border. Police opened up the boot of the car and it was packed full of uh, performance enhancing drugs. So it um, made us realise that uh, in fact it's not just individuals who are uh, sampling and using drugs, but in fact it was teams that were getting involved in this. So it was a trigger in fact for something I'll be referring to in a few moments, uh, the need for an international anti-doping agency. Because prior to that, individual sports and individual organisations had been trying to deal with the problem of doping in sport individually and um, using different rules and regulations. So athletes in one sport are looking at athletes in another sport thinking, well, why are they allowed to do that and we can't? So it was a bit of a, a mishmash. Moving on to uh, 2003, Balco, the Bay Area Laboratory, um, I don't know if any of you remember this, there were quite a number of top flight athletes who were uh, found to have taken the substance tetrahydrogestrinone, also known as the clear. It was a, a designer drug, I hate that term designer, which drug is not designed after all, but uh, designer drug is uh, one that's often used by these backstreet laboratories for substances they produce and then sell to athletes to try and encourage them to, to buy these things and uh, enhance their performance. Uh, it was supposed to be undetectable, but of course uh, it was eventually detected. But it uh, illustrated again some of the issues about athletes using these drugs. They will find these drugs from backstreet laboratories, take these drugs, and of course these drugs have not undergone any safety checks. As many of you know from the chemistry industry, pharmaceutical industry, all drugs that are uh, produced within the industry are tested not only for therapeutic purposes but equally for adverse effects to make sure they are safe to use. But these sort of drugs produced in back street laboratories, uh, they're not interested at all in safety issues, they just want to sell these products to athletes and athletes are prepared to use them so they're putting themselves in great danger. More recently of course, uh, 2012 Lance Armstrong, the famous cyclist, um, was banned for life from uh, sport. Now the interesting issue about this was Lance Armstrong claimed he was the most tested athlete in the world, which at that time he probably was, and had never tested positive. But nonetheless, he was banned for life. The reason they got away with it for so long, he and his team, uh, if you look at the substances that are being used, erythropoietin, human growth hormone, testosterone, blood doping, these are all products which are naturally occurring in the body. And though they are banned in sport, of course, it is very difficult to, to show conclusively that an athlete <coughs> is using these drugs, um, what is a normal level of these drugs in the body. But the reason that he was banned for life was um, because his teammates snitched on him, if I use that term. Um, so he was actually sanctioned without ever having tested positive for a prohibited drug. And moving up to date, these headlines you've seen in the newspaper, well perhaps not the uh, one on the right, but um, there's constantly issues about doping in sport which are uh, reaching the press. So turning to the issue of why drugs are misused in sport, uh, these are some reasons given by uh, Marente Sanchez and colleagues in, in this paper who did a, a major review of athletes and um, asked them about 
drugs that we're using and why they were using it. So clearly some of these are more obvious reasons, achieving athletic success by improved performance and linked with that, of course, financial gain. These are the two key drivers. Sad to say that in my day I participated in sport for the love of sport. I do feel that most children these days are going to sport for the fame and fortune <coughs> rather than the love of the sport. But that's the, um, the way things are these days. But in addition to improving performance, of course, athletes are also interested in rapid recovery from competition and from training. So drugs are used for that purpose as well. And prevention of nutritional deficiencies. But another key f factor is this constant fear of athletes that they might be the only person who is not using drugs. So there's this peer pressure, both direct and indirect pressure, that they are the only ones not uh, using drugs and therefore they should be using them. Now we can add to this a number of compounding factors, as I've put it, to these factors mentioned in the last slide. Um, sport is so much driven now by <coughs> commercialism, professionalism and financial gain. And media speculation, I showed you one or two headlines, we'll talk about media speculation a little bit later. But all this engenders fear in the athlete's mind that perhaps they are the only one that's not using uh, performance enhancing drugs. But there's also indirect pressure from uh, support team, the people who are aiding and abetting athletes, mostly for the benefit, but occasionally uh, illegally. Availability, where do athletes get their drugs from now? Of course, just go on the internet, you put any drug on Google search and you'll find a source to find it. Linked with that, of course, athletes uh, might be looking for drugs to go on the internet and they're not pharmacologists, they're not chemists. They have, don't have the, l the knowledge and the understanding as to what these drugs actually do and the adverse effects associated with them. And linked with that is misleading information, that products that you can get through the internet are not always well labelled. So athletes might not be aware of the fact that they're taking a prohibited substance or a substance which could do them potentially harm. And then of course there's this culture of substance taking in sport which has been going on for 2,000 years. So the key thing as far as athletes are concerned is what we call a strict liability rule. So if an athlete tests positive, it's no use there saying, oh, well, it's not my fault, I was given this, and somebody forced me to take this, blah, blah, blah. The point is that the athlete themselves are solely responsible for any prohibited substance found within their system, whether there was an intention to cheat or not. Uh, so you'll see this time and time again in cases that come up in the, in the press. So it's the athlete's own responsibility to ensure that they remain clean. So that's a, a brief introduction to where we're up to now with doping in sport. Uh, so let's turn our attention now to the regulation of doping, what we can do to try to prevent it. So the history of anti-doping in sport goes back, as I mentioned before, um, down to the 1960s when it was realised that athletes were using drugs, um, but all sports and all organisations were operating different rules and regulations. So the IOC set up uh, a medical commission to try to oversee um, the effects of doping within sport and to bring in some regulations. So they set up their medical commission in 1967. It wasn't particularly effective, but it was at least a first step in the, in the direction of trying to control doping in sport. The first prohibited list was also produced in that year. And as you can see from the slide, there were just four classes of drugs on that list. We'll look at the current list in, in a few minutes. So there were just three types of stimulant and narcotic analgesics. Now, of course, we knew that anabolic steroids were being used by athletes in the 1960s, <coughs> but they didn't appear on the prohibited list because we didn't have effective methods for testing anabolic steroids. And if you are going to prohibit a drug, then you do really need to have a, a validated, foolproof method to ensure that you can prove conclusively that an athlete is, is using that class of drugs. So we didn't have that in 1967, so drugs like anabolic steroids uh, were, were not banned. Moving on to the 1970s, uh, the issue of testing of athletes started to come in. So the first comprehensive testing at Olympic Games was in the Munich Games in 1972. And 
by 76, we had a, a reasonably validated method for steroids, so steroids were uh, tested for at the Montreal Olympic Games. In the 1980s, um, the Court of Arbitration for Sport became operational, and of course this is the body uh, to which athletes can turn if they feel that they have been uh, misjudged, uh, if they want to appeal against any uh, accusations that are laid at them. So increasingly the court, court of Arbitration is being used uh, to, uh, in disputes between athletes and the anti-doping organisations. 1999, key year, if you remember, I mentioned in 1998, the Festina affair in the, in the Tour de France. That was the trigger for um, bringing in some sort of universal anti-doping organisation. So in 1999, the IOC, who was the main body responsible for uh, anti-doping at that time, uh, convened a conference on doping in sport in, in Lausanne. And they came up with the Lausanne Declaration on Doping in Sport. So this was the first time that they got together all stakeholders within sport to sit down and think, well, how can we tackle this problem uh, worldwide? And what came out from that Lausanne Declaration was the concept of the World Anti-Doping Agency. Alan mentioned WADA before. Well, that's what WADA stands for, the World Anti-Doping Agency. So that was established on the 10th of November 1999 and is now the body which oversees anti-doping around the world. So the mission is to lead a, a collaborative worldwide movement for doping-free sport. It's um, a, a tough one to achieve, but that is the mission of WADA. It's funded equally by the IOC and by governments, and the budget is, as you can see on the slide, around $30 million a year. In fact, it's probably slightly more than that now. So what does uh, WADA do? Well, it oversees um, all of the organisations who are involved in sport, what we might call the stakeholders. So WADA and the code, I'll come to the code in a moment, oversees at the international level organisations like the International Olympic Committee, Paralympic Committee, international sports federations and government involvement in anti-doping organisation, in anti-doping activities. Uh, below the international level, we have the national level, so National Olympic and Paralympic Committees, National Federations, and we have NADOs and RADO, RADOs, so National Anti-Doping Organisations and Regional Anti-Doping Organisations. And again, as Alan mentioned in the introduction, our NADO in this country is UK Anti-Doping, UCAD. Uh, so that's at the national level, and then below that, of course, we have the athletes themselves, and as mentioned on this slide, the entourage. We have a, a new terminology now for the entourage, what we call athlete support personnel. It's a generic term which uh, came in in the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, and then below that, the Court of Arbitration in Sport and the laboratories, which are responsible for doing the testing of um, drugs within sport. So WADA is responsible for overseeing all of these activities at all of these levels. I mentioned the code. Um, the code has been in existence now for since uh, 2002. We're now on the latest version, which is um, the uh, 2015 version. And the code sets out all of the doping policies, rules and regulations that all the organisations involved in sport must abide by in order to try to control doping in sport. Um, there is access to it, website there, nice little bedtime reading if everybody fancied uh, reading through all the rules and regulations. <laughs> But the code works in harmony and collaboration with five international standards, which lay out in even more detail the rules and regulations associated with the prohibited list, what drugs and methods are not allowed to be used in sport, therapeutic use exemption, I'll explain what that is in a moment, um, what testing procedures and investigations need to be carried out, um, rules and regulations about protecting privacy for um, the athletes and also the rules and regulations that laboratories have to uh, abide by. So I haven't got time to go through all of those but I'll very briefly mention the first three. So let's start with the prohibited list. Again, easily accessible on the, the website, just go onto Wada's website and uh, you'll find the prohibited list. If anybody's interested, I've got a copy here uh, you can have a look at. So what is the prohibited list and how do we decide what goes on the prohibited list? Well, there are three criteria 
and only two of those need to apply in order to put a drug on the list. Uh, personally, I find these a little loose uh, criteria. The first one is fine, potential to enhance or enhan enhance the sport, sport performance. So if a drug can do that, enhance performance, then it can go onto the list. The second one, actual or potential health risk to the player. Now those of you who work with drugs know there's no such thing as a drug that doesn't have side effects, so really any drug has the potential uh, to produce a health risk to the player in terms of side effects. And the third criteria, that the use of the drug will violate the spirit of sport. I bet if I ask each of you to define what you think the spirit of sport is, you'd come up with um, as many uh, answers as there are people here tonight. But those are the criteria that are, are worked with, and as I say, uh, a drug only has to comply with two of those criteria in order to put on the list. So, this is the list. I um, apologise for a rather busy, busy slide, and I haven't got time to go through the whole list, but I will try to give you an idea as to, to what it encompasses. So this is the um, January 2016 list, which uh, runs now until January 2017, so it's reviewed every year. Now the water prohibited list comprises what we call substances, mainly drugs, but also methods. So I'll come on to the methods in a moment. So it's not just about um, products, um, chemical products. There are some methods that are prohibited as well. So let's deal with the substances first. So they are then classified under three headings. There are those that are prohibited at all times. So an athlete should never use any of these substances, any of these drugs, at any time, either in competition or out of competition. There are some products, some drugs, which are only prohibited within competition. So these are drugs which can only potentially benefit the athlete while they're competing, whereas these have the potential to benefit the athlete even during training. So obvious example of that is anabolic agents, anabolic steroids. So these are drugs that athletes take in order to build up uh, muscle mass and strength. So they do this during training, not during competing. So that's why those drugs are prohibited at all times. There are a couple of odd uh, examples of drugs which are prohibited just in certain sports. I won't really go into much detail on that. And then we come to the methods. And these methods are, again, prohibited at all times. So the biggest one there is manipulation of blood and blood con components. And the main area here is things like blood doping. But there's also um, athletes who participate in chemical and physical manipulation. In other words, tricks to try to avoid detection. And the final one, which is um, one which we need to keep very clear focus on, is gene doping. It's actually been on the prohibited list as a method for quite a number of years, but um, we still don't know whether athletes are participating in gene doping or whether it's uh, something that, that we still need to look out for for the future. Basically, what we're talking about here is um, the adaptation of gene therapy, which is still in its infancy, as you know, um, where athletes can use gene technology in order to alter their genes and improve performance that way. So it's one that, uh, as I say, we need to be aware of for the future. So that's the prohibited list. If you've got any questions about the list, uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions at the end. Now I mentioned the list is reviewed annually. So there is a WADA prohibited list expert group who review the list. And in fact, um, earlier today, I was just talking to Mark Stewart, who's a colleague of mine, and um, he's just come back from Canada. Uh, he's a member of that expert uh, list group. Uh, particularly they've been discussing rec recent events that have been happening in, in the press, but uh, um, the expert group uh, review the list on an annual basis. Now they take into account a lot of factors. Um, stakeholders, so any organisation that's involved in anti-doping can feed into the expert group and give advice about what they think should be <laughs> prohibited on the list. Um, they look at the statistics from the accredited laboratories, so the laboratories that carry out all the tests, to see if they have noticed any um, activities within athletes that are not currently um, documented. And of course, there's the research evidence. Talk a little bit about research at the end. So all of these factors are taken into account when the expert group review the list every year. Now, what they 
also do is to have a what's called a monitoring program. So in addition to the prohibited list, there's a list of drugs, I'll show you what the list is in a moment, um, of drugs which have either been on the prohibited list or have been removed, or substances which may have the potential as performance enhancing drugs. Uh, so that list is reviewed throughout the year to see if there are any patterns of use by athletes. Now there's a prime example of this uh, related to recent events. If you look at the monitoring programme for last year, 2015, um, these were the drugs that were being monitored and you'll notice meldonium, of course, been in the press quite a lot recently. So it had been monitored throughout 2015. Now one of the monitoring uh, activities that went on was that during the Baku 2015 European Games, which didn't have a high profile press-wise, but it was a, a major new event which took place in Russia, um, they were looking at particularly meldonium use uh, during their monitoring programme. And what they found at these games and the testing of athletes was that out of 762 urine samples, uh, there were 66, uh, nearly 9% of cases, of use of meldonium. 13 of the medalists um, or competition winners declared that they were using meldonium and meldonium use was detected in athletes competing in 15 of the 21 sports during the games. So because of this monitoring program being going on, because they specifically looked at meldonium use by athletes, it was decided that there was a case to put it on the prohibited list. So lo and behold, Meldonium was placed on the prohibited list in January 2016. So prior to that, it was okay, it wasn't prohibited, athletes could use it. From January 2016, it became prohibited. And of course, as we know now, uh, Maria Sharapova tested positive for meldonium in March 2016 and her case has yet to be reviewed, but um, she clearly contravened the rules and regulations because though she claimed to have been taking the drug for 10 years prior to January, quite legally, um, because she carried on taking it into 2016, tested positive, strict liability rules apply, so she will be sanctioned, but as I say, we have yet to hear what the details of that case will turn out to be. Um, in addition to Maria, of course, uh, the WADA laboratories have discovered that, uh, in fact, there have been 172 cases of meldonium use since January 2016. So it's a, a typical example of a drug which had the potential for performance enhancement. The WADA uh, group monitored its effect in athletes, found there was extensive use and have now put it onto the uh, prohibited list. So that's the prohibited list. The, the second standard I want to briefly talk about is therapeutic using exemption. So this is uh, a means by which Athletes who need to take a prohibited drug for perfectly legitimate therapeutic purposes can do so, but they have to get a doctor's note to allow them to do that. So it's a treatment of a legitimate medical condition, even though it is prohibited. Uh, just one or two examples here. Again, sorry, it's a little bit busy, this um, slide. But this is a list of all these drugs are on the prohibited list. But these are medical conditions that athletes um, have and may um, succumb to for which they need treatment with one of these drugs from the prohibited list. So these are just examples of um, uh, drugs. For instance, um, diabetes. Famous athletes um, who suffer from diabetes uh, may need to take insulin. Well, insulin is actually on the prohibited list. You're not allowed to use insulin. So if you do need to take it, then you have to get this therapeutic use exemption. So there are criteria, obviously, for granting therapeutic use exemption. So obviously the athlete has to show with their prescriber, the doctor, that there is uh, an impairment to health if the treatment was withheld. So the athlete would suffer health-wise if they were not allowed to use the drug. Also, there's no uh, permitted alternatives. So in the case of some drugs, there may be equivalent drugs which are not on the prohibited list, so athletes should be taking those rather than the pr prohibited drug. Now, the, the third one is the, the tricky one. I'm, I'm glad I'm not a medical prescriber because the athlete is allowed and their prescriber allowed to administer this prohibited drug, 
uh, up to the point where no additional performance enhancement other than the return of the athlete to a normal state of health takes place. Very difficult, of course, to titrate that, which does mean that, of course, therapeutic use exemption is um, open to potential abuse, uh, but <coughs> that's just speculation. So those are the criteria for granting a TUE. Um, it's not just a matter of the doctors signing a piece of paper saying, yes, the athlete's got to take this drug. They have to provide full medical history. Um, there has to be accurate diagnosis that the athlete is suffering from the condition they're claiming to suffer from and does need the drug. Alternatives being um, considered. And also, therapeutic use exemption is not a um, permanent uh, exemption. Athletes have to keep reapplying for it. So there is dosage time and uh, period of treatment which is defined on the therapeutic use exemption form. So it is um, a means by which athletes can um, use prohibited drugs but under very strict rules and regulations. We had a, a lot uh, during the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, a lot of our attention within the pharmacy was directed towards uh, drugs we were um, dispensing which were on the prohibited list so we had to ensure that the athlete uh, and their medical practitioner provided us with therapeutic use exemption um, uh, forms uh, before we could dispense these drugs for the athletes. So that's uh, therapeutic use exemption. The, the third one I'll briefly talk about is testing and investigation. So the purpose of this international standard is to allow stakeholders to plan and conduct effective testing. Um, and also increasingly now it used to be just the uh, an international standard related to testing but in the last 12 months or so it's now testing and investigations far more emphasis now is being placed placed on targeting athletes finding out which athletes are using drugs through intelligence and investigations so this um, in international standard is trying to promote that um, concept of intelligence and investigations not just testing so when are athletes tested? Well, I've already mentioned it's both in competition and out of competition. Clearly in competitions, easy to understand, but out of competition, an athlete can be tested anytime, any place without prior notice. Literally, it's down to that. I'll elaborate on that in a moment. Who is tested? Well, really any athlete who is competing in sport could be tested. Obviously an emphasis tends to be placed more on the more elite athletes that are competing at a higher level, but anybody who is competing as a sports person could be subject to, to testing anytime, any place, anywhere. So for the more elite athletes, um, the international sports federations and national anti-doping organisations have what they call registered testing pools. So the top athletes are placed on that pool and these athletes have additional um, rules and regulations they must abide by, one of which is what we call whereabouts information. So whereabouts information means that those athletes on registered testing pools every three months have to go online and provide details of where they're going to be so that testers can go out and test them any place, anytime, anywhere. So they have to go online and for every day, say an hour slot, sometime between six o'clock and 11 o'clock at night, where they will be available for testing. And most athletes tend to say, well, six o'clock to seven o'clock in the morning, I'll, I'll be at home in bed. But of course, if they're away training, if they're away competing, they have to think ahead and where they're going to be and where they're likely to be staying and give information so that they testers can go along and find them at those designated hours. So that's the sort of form they have to do. So for three months, for every day, those three months, they have to give an hour to stay where they're going to be. Can you imagine having to do that? <laughs> now, not surprisingly, there are things can go wrong. Um, athletes forget that they're going to be somewhere <coughs> or plans change. Um, but they're allowed one or two mistakes. Now I'll talk about anti-doping rule violations a little bit later, but one of the anti-doping rule violations, in other words, one of the violations that you could be sanctioned for is what we call whereabouts failures. So if an athlete misses 
three or more tests or fails to be where they're, they're supposed to be when they said they're going to be uh, during a 12-month period, then they can be sanctioned. Now, a typical example of where the media sometimes gets things wrong, uh, you may remember this headline a few um, months ago, Farah missed two drug tests, so everybody said, oh, he must be doping, he's um, awful, ban him. But, in fact, the... Uh, details of that was that uh, Mo Farah actually missed two drug tests over a three-year period. And not surprisingly, over a three-year period, it's, um, I, I, mean, I think I would find it very difficult to say where I'm going to be one, one hour a day every day for a three-month period in time. So he did actually miss two, but of course he wasn't sanctioned because it uh, didn't fall within the um, three, three missed tests within 12-month period. So that's um, the code and the international standards. So I now want to talk a little bit about the analytical testing. So I want you to put yourself in, be in the position of an athlete now. So this is what you would have to go through if you were uh, an elite athlete uh, who is subject to analytical testing. So the procedures are outlined on this slide. So first of all, athletes are selected for testing. They're notified where to go. Chaperoning, I mentioned. Uh, reporting to the doping control center and sample collection. So let's just briefly look at um, this procedure. All of this is conducted, by the way, by uh, trained doping control officers. So these are people who are employed by national doping organizations like UKAD, uh, fully trained up. There's a lot of training has to go into um, doping control officer um, activities. Um, so let's go through the process. So action athletes are first of all selected. <coughs> So if it's out of competition testing, then the athletes are chosen from the registered testing pools or wherever uh, by their international federation or national anti-doping organization. If the testing is being carried out in competition, like at the Olympic Games, I was privileged to be at the, the final night of the velodrome and Laura Trott had just won her gold medal in the Omnium. So she and the other two athletes came second and third would automatically be tested. So usually at major sporting events, the top three athletes would be taken for testing, plus random selection of other athletes as well. So the athlete would be notified that they need <coughs> to go to be tested. They're informed of their rights and responsibilities by the doping control officer. Uh, they can, of course, request a representative if they wish. And in the case of a major sporting event, they may need an interpreter to come along as well. But they are then instructed to go along to attend the doping control station. Now, there may be delays in getting to the doping control station um, because, as in this case, um, this is Laura Trott coming to talk to the BBC here. So uh, maybe medal ceremonies, maybe interviews, maybe other instances where athletes will be delayed in go, going to the doping control station. But the important thing is during that time they will be chaperoned. So you'll notice here one of the volunteers, one of the games makers with a green armband there, she is a chaperone. So that person, as soon as the athlete was notified they had to go to the doping control station, would have a chaperone covering them for the whole period of time until they reach the doping control station. Obviously to try to stop athletes from getting up to the tricks that uh, they have tried to do, manipulating samples, sharing urine samples and so on um, prior to going to doping control. Once they get to doping control station, then obviously if it's been a, a competition where athletes have dehydrated, then they will prov be provided with fluids to rehydrate. This could take quite a long time, but an athlete will have to stay in the doping control station till they have provided the urine sample. So the rest of the team might have gone off on the bus, but the athlete would have to remain until they rehydrate and can provide a sample of urine. Now you'll notice the second point is that the sample is given under direct observation by the doping control officer. So the athlete has to remove sufficient clothing so that the doping control officer can actually see the urine sample being given. There have been cases in the past where athletes have shared urine, had false bladders in their arm and all sorts of things. Not often, but uh, it has happened. So we have to go to that extent now to watch the urine samples being given. 
Increasingly now, of course, uh, athletes are giving not just urine samples, but also blood samples, and uh, talk more about that um, later. Now, at this point, where the athlete has given their sample, they have to make certain declarations. First of all, they were confirmed that the processes were all satisfactory and everything was hunky-dory. But also at this stage, they have to declare whether they have been taken any medications, supplements, or any drug or substance over the previous seven days. Now, it's in their interest to do this because, as you're probably aware, there are cases of athletes taking prohibited drugs inadvertently. So it's at this stage they need to declare what they've taken in the past so it can be investigated whether an inadvertent use of drugs uh, was documented. They also have to declare if they've got any therapeutic use exemption forms and whether they've uh, had any blood transfusions within the previous six weeks. This is relating back to things like blood doping where athletes have a higher than normal red blood cell count. So that's the declaration stage. Uh, all the samples are then sealed and securely packaged and sent off to the laboratory. Now there has to be a, a chain of custody document accompanying those documents. So anybody who has access to those um, uh, samples has to sign to say that they, they've had it. So that, again, there's a, a trail that you can, an audit trail you can look back on. The samples then arrive at the laboratory. Now, currently there are only 35 WADA accredited laboratories worldwide. Now, when you think of the number of athletes who are competing in sport, 35 is not a, a large number. These are WADA accredited laboratories. Now, if you remember, one of the international standards was about laboratories, so there are a huge number of rules and regulations about laboratories and the equipment they have to have, the personnel operating the um, uh, laboratory, and so on and so forth. So, um, 35, Qatar, as um, Alvin said, I've been out to Qatar quite a number of times, and in fact, um, when I was out there last year, August, they uh, achieved their accreditation, so they're the, the latest laboratory to be added to the, the WADA list. Um, the 35 laboratories are worldwide. Uh, one or two things to point out here. Uh, we've got them in Asia, Americas, Oceania, Europe. Uh, when you think of the number of countries in Africa. There's just one laboratory in South Africa. Of course, where countries don't have laboratories, they have to get their athletes tested in, in other countries. So it's a bit of a logistical problem, should we say, um, with African athletes. Uh, of course, we've got a um, laboratory here in London at uh, King's College. Um, during the Olympic Games, of course, um, GSK uh, provided a state-of-the-art laboratory to do all the testing in collaboration with the, the London Laboratory. Other points to, to notice here that, um, of course, with all the brouhaha that's going on at the moment, Moscow has been revoked. Now, this is very serious because uh, you know what's been happening in, in Russia uh, in all sorts of levels. So their uh, laboratory is revoked. They're not allowed to do any testing. And, in fact, again, UK anti-doping are helping the, the Russians in terms of doing some testing for them. Um, and of course, RUSADA, the Russian anti-doping organization, is also suspended at the moment. But it's not just uh, what's happening in Russia. Just this month, Lisbon and a few days ago, China have both been suspended. Now, the reason for this is um, because they're accredited laboratories, they will be periodically tested by the World Anti-Doping Agency. So these laboratories will be sent spiked samples and the laboratory has to show that um, they can detect what's in those spike samples and the concentration of drugs in there. So if uh, a laboratory fails to do that for whatever reason, then they could be suspended, as has happened with Lisbon and Beijing uh, just this last month. So those are the laboratories. So what happens when the laboratories carry out the tests? And of course, there's a whole batch of testing that's, that's done within the laboratories, uh, gas chromatography and um, um, NMR are the two of the main um, systems that are used, but there's a whole plethora of uh, drug testing that goes on. When you think about that prohibited list and the sort of drugs that are, are tested for, it, it's uh, a whole spectrum of um, equipment that's needed. So what happens um, if the result of the test is negative? Well, that's fine. The athlete's informed 
Their national anti-doping organisation is, is informed the athlete was clean on this occasion, but increasingly now, athletes' urine samples are being kept for up to 10 years. And the reason for that is so that retrospective testing can take place if new, more sophisticated testing techniques are developed. So you can go back if there's suspicion that an athlete was um, doping previous years, and in fact this happened um, at London 2012, that some retrospective testing was done of athletes who competed in um, Athens, and some athletes were prevented from uh, competing in uh, London because of retrospective testing that uh, took place. Um, if it's a positive result, then of course the athlete has to account for why they have a prohibited drug within their system. So a hearing is set up and sanctions may be applied. So let's turn to what happens if in such a case, so what we call results management. I mentioned uh, earlier about um, whereabouts failures, so that's number four of what we call anti-doping rule violations. So there are currently ten ways in which an athlete may be sanctioned, uh, or not ten ways in which they're sanctioned, but um, if they contravene any one or more of these anti-doping rule violations, then they will be sanctioned. I uh, haven't got time to go through it all, and again, apologies for the busyness of the slide. Basically, the first five are all to do with the testing procedure we've just looked at. So if there's presence of a substance within the sample, um, things like whereabouts failures, an athlete fails to turn up for testing, uh, evading, refusing, failing to submit samples, any attempts at tampering with samples. So all of these are ways in which athletes can be sanctioned. Uh, but as in the case of Lance Armstrong, uh, he wasn't um, sanctioned for presence of a drug, but he was for possession, for trafficking and administering drugs to other people. So if athletes participate in that, then they may be again sanctioned for uh, getting involved in those rule violations. The last two uh, were added in um, 2015, uh, what we call complicity and prohibited association. Now these two anti-doping rule violations are not specifically but um, largely directed towards these people that I referred to before, athlete support personnel. So athlete support personnel who comply with athletes to enable them to, prohibit, uh, to use prohibited drugs, they can be sanctioned for that. And prohibited association, the other way around, if an athlete uh, uses a, a coach or a doctor who has previously been shown to be involved in doping, then the athlete can be sanctioned for that. So it's all very complicated. So if an athlete um, has a rule violation, any one of these or more than one of these, then they will be sanctioned. Now, the sanctions that apply are of two types. The first one only applies if the um, violation occurred within competition. So if it was within competition, then the athlete would be disqualified from whatever event they took part in and they would have to forfeit any medals, points, prizes that were awarded for that. So that's just within competition. But the second one, ineligibility, applies to both in competition and out of competition. So if an athlete is shown to have um, fallen foul of the, the rule violations, then they will be barred from uh, participating in sport. They won't be allowed to receive any sponsorship or funding and in fact, um, athletes uh, are also not allowed to carry on training within their sport organisation if they are ineligible for um, uh, participating in sport. Now, sanctions can be increased and decreased. So if the athlete undertakes what we call uh, aggravating circumstances, circumstances, in other words, if they have been shown to be using drugs, but also have been shown to be involved in trafficking, using multiple substances and methods, then their sanction can be increased. But on the other hand, sanctions can be reduced if either the athlete immediately admits to the fact that they're using the drug um, and maybe offers substantial assistance in um, pointing the finger at other athletes. So they can get a, a reduction, not necessarily a significant reduction, but they can get a reduction for that. But the other one, the more important one, is that an athlete can get a reduced sanction 
if they can establish what's called no significant fault or negligence. So this refers to this um, inadvertent use of drugs, where an athlete has tested positive, but um, it's subsequently found that the athlete took the drug inadvertently. Now, it's very difficult for the athlete to prove this. Remember, strict liability rules apply, so it's the athlete's responsibility for what's in their body. So to prove that they had no significant fault or negligence is difficult for the athlete to actually prove, but it is, it is possible. So in summary, the sanctions that apply, if it's uh, obviously intentional doping, then the athlete now is banned for normally four years or could be, as in the case of Lance Armstrong, up to lifetime. It was two-year ban, a standard ban up to um, the beginning of 2015, but it's now been increased to four years. Main reason for that is, of course, if you're banned for four years, then you will miss at least one Olympic Games. It might sound a bit peculiar, but that's one of the main reasons why they increased it to four years. So the intentional doping, you'll get an automatic ban of that. If you can show no significant fault or negligence, it depends on how strong a case the athlete can put forward to show that they um, were unaware that they'd taken the drug, they can be as low as reprimand up to two-year ban. So it depends case by case as to what uh, strength of a case the athlete can, can put forward. In the best scenario, the athlete can actually show no fault or negligence that they were completely unaware, they got all the evidence to show that it wasn't their fault, in which case they would not be sanctioned, but that's a very rare circumstance. So those are the, the broad sanctions that, that apply. Now, testing, sanctioning is very important, but as John Fahey, the water president at the time, said, testing alone is not enough uh, to lead the fight against doping in sport. So going back to this issue of intelligence and investigations. So WADA increasingly now, as well as doing testing for athletes, is co collaborating and cooperating with these sort of agencies. Law enforcement agencies, both national and international, Interpol. So they are collaborating with these agencies uh, to increase the intelligence about things like trafficking of drugs. Uh, customs and border agencies, so if an athlete is um, entering in a country and the border agencies uh, have some suspicion about this bottle of blood that the athlete happens to be <laughs> carrying into the country, then questions may be raised. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, WADA is now collaborating with pharmaceutical companies to find out whether there are any products, drugs in the pipeline that are likely to be licensed in years to come, which could have the potential for performance enhancement. So trying to get intelligence about these before athletes can get access to them. And increasingly, of course, um, investigative journalists. We have seen so many cases in the, the press just recently. Well, uh, I'm a little bit sceptical about uh, investigative journalists, but they are providing a service insofar as they are highlighting issues which the World Anti-Doping Agency <coughs> would not themselves normally be able to investigate. But if they, these issues are highlighted, then it's up to WADA to investigate them further, as is happening with uh, many of the cases that are in the press at the moment. So, let's move on to a bit of speculation. How widely are drugs misused in sport? Well, I'm sure if I asked you all now to name a percentage of athletes who you thought were using drugs, I'm sure you'd come up with all sorts of different answers. Well, the true answer is, we don't know. The reason we don't know is some, well, some reasons given here. Media speculation. Um, again, more headlines. <laughs> I'll just let you dwell on those for a moment. They tend to be rather inflammatory, but of course, what are the media trying to do? They're trying to sell newspapers. So the, the bigger the story, then the more newspapers they'll sell. So they tend to be rather inflammatory, these headlines, but as far as the athletes are concerned, they see these, and it's that worry again. Are all other athletes taking drugs? Keep seeing it in the newspapers. Am I the only one that's not using drugs? So again, it's this pressure on them. So media speculation, uh, they'd have us believe that 
all athletes are using drugs. So that's one extreme. We can look at um, published research surveys. So these have been carried out. We've done some of these ourselves, but I have to say it's not strong evidence. So you can ask athletes um, whether they uh, use drugs, either self-reporting, do you use drugs? Well, even though it might be anonymous surveys, how many athletes are going to own up to the fact that they are using drugs? So that's not very accurate. Or you can use perceptual reporting. You can ask an athlete, well, we're not asking you are using drugs, but do you think other athletes are using them? Well, of course they are. That's why they're all better than I am. So you're not going to get accurate figures from that. So what are we left with? Official statistics. So these are the statistics from the WADA accredited laboratories in 2014. We've not had the 2015 figures yet. So from all of those, well, it was 34 laboratories then, from all those laboratories, these are the numbers of positive results for the different classes of drugs on the prohibited list. So as you can see, anabolic agents by far are still the, the largest group of drugs in terms of use by athletes. Uh, stimulants are up there. Diuretics, quite surprisingly really, because uh, diuretics, well, they're used for two purposes, one of which um, is masking agents to produce large volumes of urine, which theoretically would mask the fact they'd be using other drugs. But the testing facilities are so sophisticated that that's unlikely to work. But the other area where diuretics are used is, of course, in sports like horse racing, jockeys, and in um, competitive boxing and things like that, where weight categories count. So an athlete or some athletes in those sort of sports use diuretics at the time of the weigh-in to try to reduce their weight temporarily to get into a lower weight category. So diuretics are quite widely used. Uh, glucocorticoids, beta agonists and so on. So those are the bald figures. Those are the number of positive results for each of those classes of drugs in 2014. Is that what, sorry? Do you mean alcohol is completely useless to sport involved? Um, yeah, pretty well. Uh, the reason alcohol is on the prohibited list is, is not for its performance enhancing properties, but it's uh, only banned in sports where being under the influence of alcohol may have adverse effect on fellow competitors. So it's mainly in sports where motorized, motor, motor racing, things like that, uh, air sports, where if you are under the influence of alcohol, you could kill somebody else. So it's not really a performance enhancing effect. But yeah, there were no cases of that uh, within 2014. Um, so what does this mean in terms of percentage? Well, in 2014, there were two, 283,000 plus samples analyzed, and that was the number of adverse findings. If you look at that percentage, that tells us that 1.36% of athletes were doping. You may or may not agree with that figure. Um, certainly a bit different from the 90 to 100% that newspapers would have us believe. Um, the truth probably lies somewhere between. Even the then chief executive of WADA in 2011 was suggesting that about 10% of athletes were cheating uh, by using prohibited substances. But as I say, the figures are speculative. We, we really don't know. Right, well, I was um, asked to talk about the future. I admit, I uh, really don't know what's going to happen in the future. But what I've done is to point out some of the issues which I think are increasingly going to be important in the future. So I'm going to briefly look at um, tackling the issue of supply and demand research, how much research is being carried on. One or two innovations uh, with regard to detecting drugs and it's raising awareness. So let's look at those in turn. So tackling supply and demand. Supply-wise, uh, we need to do far more in the way of um, intelligence, uh, collaborating with um, Interpol and other organizations to find out just what is happening with regard to uh, trafficking of drugs, global trafficking of drugs. Um, I won't name them, but I'm sure you can guess probably which country in the world is um, the greatest supplier of prohibited drugs through internet sources and through other sources. So it needs to be tackled. I mentioned previously about supplements and inadvertent use. Well, 
supplements is a, a major, major issue. This uh, is quite a frightening figure um, from this report in 2013 that the global sales of supplements are estimated at $104 billion. So an awful lot of supplements. Um, I won't ask how many people here use supplements, but I'm sure a large percentage of you use supplements for whatever reason. So it's not just athletes we're talking about here, but um, the population as a whole. We are sucked into this um, concept of needing supplements. But they are used by athletes, and it's estimated that probably between 65 and 95 percent of athletes are using supplements. Nutritional supplements, dietary supplements, ergogenic supplements, whatever. They feel they need these supplements in order to not just enhance performance, but keep them up to a certain level of, of health. Whether it's all rational or not, again, not going to get into that debate. We have a whole um, uh, group of sports nutritionists who help and advise athletes, and uh, I wouldn't like to cross swords with them, but some of the um, products that are given to athletes, I, I do question sometimes. <laughs> but athletes are using these things. So the question is, are these supplements safe to use for competing athletes? Well, in an answer, as you know, no. The reason they're not safe to use is that unlike medicinal products produced by pharmaceutical companies which are very closely regulated, the producers of supplements have virtually no regulations. So they can produce what they like, when they like, sell them how they like, very little regulation. You look at the labeling of some of these supplements which are misleading is perhaps a, a generous word to to give uh, either the labeling does not state what's actually in the product so the athlete might be taking a prohibited drug and not even know by reading the label or the labeling may be couched in such terms that the athlete just doesn't understand it they're not pharmacologists they're not chemists they don't understand what this gobbledygook on the labeling is on these supplements and the third uh, issue is about contamination. That these products are often produced in the laboratories, if I can use that word, which are, are not, again, well screened. Uh, so a product theoretically has not got a prohibited drug in it, but because of contamination within the manufacturing process, then there might be prohibited substances within the supplements. And of course, the testing sophistication now is such that you can detect very minute amounts of substances within athletes. So in a nutshell, no supplements are, are not safe to use for competing athletes. What we can try to do to encourage athletes um, to avoid inadvertent use through supplements is to use products from a, um, a more ethical source, we put it that way. And also there's um, some organizations which carry out batch testing of supplements to test whether the supplements are clear of prohibited drugs. So I encourage athletes to use these batch tested supplements rather than just something they've bought through the internet. So supplements is a huge issue and um, needs addressing. So it's a big education issue. Uh, the evidence is there that uh, they're not safe to use. Um, these are figures from three national anti-doping organizations, Australian, UK and USA. Uh, on data between 2005-2013. So th these are the number of doping violations, positive results that the, these national organisations uh, found from athletes they tested. And between 6 and 9% of those cases were associated with supplement use. So athletes are putting themselves under a, a great risk by using um, unsafe supplements, put it that way. Uh, other issues in the future? Well, research. Um, many of you have come from a scientific background and um, realise the importance of research. So what it is committed to research, uh, a lot of it's um, directed at developing new detection methods, but also this issue of gene doping is a huge one for the future just what impact that is likely to have in the future, whether we can devise testing procedures to uh, identify gene doping is a huge question at the moment. So research is very important. Uh, WADA does commit a reasonable amount of money. Um, since 2001, they've uh, 
uh, donated $60 million to research. Uh, I guess in terms of um, how much it costs to research, that's a, a small scratch on the surface. But they are committed to encouraging research into the use of drugs in sport. Um, innovations in detection. Well, I've already mentioned about improved techniques and um, retrospective testing, which is uh, being carried on. But I want to highlight uh, this area of improving detection of testing, which is athlete biological passports. You may have heard about these. Now, the athlete biological passports um, are really keeping um, a record of athletes' hematological and steroidal profiles over a period of time. So why do we need athlete biological passports? Well, things like blood parameters, hemoglobin levels, reticular sites, um, red blood cell counts, steroidal levels in the body. These are all endogenous components. And if we measured everybody here, say how much testosterone each of you had, we'd have a inverted U-shaped curve, most of us in the middle, but you do get biological outliers. So what is a normal level of something like testosterone in the body or haemoglobin within the body? So it's difficult to put an absolute figure on this. So what is a normal level? It's impossible to say. Now, most testing is comparing one athlete against another. But in case of athlete biological passports, uh, the athlete acts as their own control. So every time an athlete... Um, gives either a blood sample or a urine sample, now we maintain a profile of their hematological parameters and steroid parameters. And from those results, each time the athlete gives a sample, you can work out mathematical algorithms which define what you would expect the upper and lower limit for that athlete to be. So you're not comparing the athlete with somebody else, you're comparing the athlete with themselves. So longitudinally monitoring the athlete will show up any abnormalities. Now let me illustrate that to hopefully uh, make it clear. So this is a normal passport profile for an athlete. So this is a, an individual athlete who's given this number of samples, in this case blood samples, and what we're looking at is haemoglobin levels. So because of this mathematical algorithm, we can define what you would expect the maximum and minimum levels of haemoglobin to be in that athlete. And as you can see, each time the athlete was tested, they fell within those limits, so that's fine. In this case, the, this particular athlete at this point suddenly exceeded the maximum limit. Now that is not in itself a reason to sanction the athlete. You can't say the athlete has been cheating just because the limit exceeded expectation. But what it does is to trigger the need for some investigation into that. So if such a case comes to light, then a panel of experts, which includes physiologists, hematologists, etc., will look at the data and investigate things that, was this an extreme of a normal variation? So going back to that haemoglobin peak, it could be that that athlete had recently come back from altitude training, where, of course, red blood cell counts would have been increased, haemoglobin levels would have been increased. So, not surprisingly, the athlete on that particular occasion exceeded what you would normally expect to find. Potential pathology. The athlete may be suffering from some condition. In fact, it's quite a useful um, monitoring process this for the health of athletes that um, this a uh, pathological condition might cause um, a fluctuation in whatever measures you're, you're measuring. So could pick, could, sorry, <coughs> could pick that up. But it also might be an indication of doping. So in this case, further investigations would be undertaken and the athlete would be very closely monitored and may ultimately be, be sanctioned. So athlete biological passports is a relatively new innovation, but it's... Uh, proving to be quite a, a useful tool in monitoring athletes uh, for the use of, of drugs. Finally, um, raising awareness. Well, use Tony Blair's <laughs> um, expression, uh, education, education, education. If you ask athletes about 
drugs, what they are, who uses them, what the prohibited list is, the level of knowledge and understanding is very, very poor. And this applies to most people. I mean, you're here tonight, hopefully, to find out a little bit more about it, and hopefully you will have learnt a lot more. So education is very important. So who do we need to target? Well, athletes themselves, but also athlete support personnel. So in terms of athletes, um, it's up to their national anti-doping organisations and international federations to carry out education programmes with athletes. But also you get things like at the 2012 Games, uh, these are just a couple of pictures from within the, the athlete dining room, uh, what has set up a, uh, an outreach um, tent so athletes could go along and find out a little bit more about doping and anti-doping. So the more we can get athletes thinking about what they're taking, why they're taking it, what the consequences are of taking these substances, then maybe we'll uh, encourage them to not take drugs. So those are the athletes themselves. In terms of the athlete support personnel, well, WADA acknowledges now that these are very important people. These are the people who help and support athletes in whatever guise. Um, how do we define athlete support personnel? It's a very broad definition. So uh, coaches, trainers, managers, team staff, medical and paramedical personnel, even parents or anybody working with athletes. We need to increase their knowledge and understanding about doping and anti-doping in sport. Now I've highlighted medical and paramedical personnel because uh, we've been heavily involved in this, as Alan mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we've been doing education programmes for <coughs> particularly medical and paramedical personnel, not just about their um, dealings with athletes in day-to-day -day, um, activities, but also these are people who might be um, volunteering for, for major sporting events like the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So in fact, with the IOC and WADA, we've done some online modules for the four to five thousand medical services personnel who will be volunteering and helping in Rio. So those people will have to undertake our online modules, pass the assessment before they're going to be allowed to, to work uh, at the Games. So the more we can get people thinking about doping and anti-doping and stopping inadvertent use of, of doping in sport, the, the better. Finally, and here's finally, I'm sorry I've gone on a little longer than I should have done, uh, the sports fans. Uh, I guess most of you would classify yourself as sports fans. Well, I'm not sure what most fans think about doping in sport. It's, it's in your face all the time. It's having a, a big impact. Um, I, I do fear for the future of sport. Uh, things like doping, um, things like um, betting in sport. This is going to have an adverse effect also on sport. Are we in the end going to be watching sport or are we going to be watching freak shows? Um, sponsorship is a major issue in sport and if you noticed recently with these uh, doping cases how quickly the sponsors have withdrawn their support of, of these athletes. So how long is it going to be before sponsors just get fed up with the whole concept of doping in sport? That's looking on, on the bleak side. We will never stop cheating in sport, we'll never stop every athlete uh, Get participating in uh, the use of prohibited drugs. But I do feel that we owe it to the sports fans to keep fighting the fight to try to stop doping in sport through the sort of issues that have been talking before. So that a, a sports fan can go to the stadium, watch the sport and feel that they're watching fair competition between clean athletes. I'm maybe uh, being a little uh, optimistic there, but I think it's worth, worth the fight.